I, I think sometimes we don't even examine our behaviors. We don't even examine our attitudes and how, like, worldly they are. And that's what struck me on this Brazil trip was, like, just how much we've twisted the American dream into our faith. College Podcast, your speaker, Pastor Taylor Gap. Just got back from Brazil. Um, and I want to tell you guys just a little bit about it. it, it obviously, God's not going to waste that experience and not give me stuff to talk about in my sermon immediately. So um, we went to Brazil. I want you to know, uh, we went to, mostly what we did was we went to schools and we gave gospel presentations. And it was really cool, something you definitely could not do in America, like, no school would let you just walk in there and do a magic trick and a gospel explanation. But we got to do that. Um, it was interesting. Um, a lot of the schools we went to, like, they they feed the kids, like, a lunch. And it's the same. Like, everywhere we went, it was just this, like, rice and beans type uh, dish that they would give the kids. And we found out, like, the second day that uh, for some of the kids in the schools, that's the meal for the day. Like, they, their parents don't have enough. And their parents send them to school so they can eat, right? So, so very, um, a lot, you know, a lot poorer areas and um, a lot less fortunate as far as um, what they have available to them. Uh, like the first or second day we were there, I met a, a believer, um, old, old man. And uh, he couldn't speak uh, English. He could only speak Portuguese and German. And so then we had, we had other people there with us that could speak, um, English and Portuguese, right? So he, they were translating the conversation. And I remember it was so early in the trip. It was kind of like, I almost just wasn't like prepared to already have like kind of spiritual things happening. And we were at this house, just like they were just feeding us. It was just like, we were just eating lunch with them essentially. And it was amazing. They, they cooked like a traditional Brazilian barbecue. Fantastic. But I, I remember he kept, this old man kept making jokes. And of course they're being translated and somehow the jokes are being translated, they're still funny. Like they, we were just laughing at everything this guy said. Like he was, so, yeah, he was so funny. And in, in the middle of it, he just stopped and he just said, what do Christians have to be unhappy about? And it was just like, well, I'm gonna sit with that for a minute. And so I, I got to thinking about that the whole trip. I like, that phrase, stuck with me because we watched this country full of people that don't have as much as we have back here in the States. And it was curious, like how joyful and how happy. And then it started to click kind of midway in the trip is it's because they haven't, the believers in Brazil haven't intertwined Christianity with the American dream. They haven't twisted the gospel into this promise of wealth and pleasure, right? So they, they, they look at it in, you know, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, well, they just got it all right. Everything in Brazil is just, man, those believers get it and we just don't get it, right? I'm not saying that. They have their own set of problems. They have their own uh, issues that they're struggling with. But it just struck me the absence of that one. That guy said, what do Christians have to be unhappy about? And I thought, I, I know a lot of unhappy Christians. <laughs> and it's because so many of us have taken the gospel and intertwined it with this consumerism religion that we have here. And we're not happy because we don't have all the things we expect God to give us. And I'm not just talking about, you know, stuff you could buy at the mall. I'm talking about career, education, spouse. We have made so many things a part of what Christianity is that we can't be happy with just God. Uh, later that week, I, I met a man, uh, another uh, elderly man who's a pastor, uh, also could not speak any English, and he had just been in a car wreck, and he was in the hospital. And he and his wife, they're pretty banged up. They're in the hospital. Um, we walked into this room, this small hospital room, and just really just observed the conversation. 
And we listened because he was actually talking, Justin McKenzie, our missions pastor, was there with us, and he was talking to Justin and, uh, and Emilio Lartigue, our, our retired missions pastor. But he was talking to them, and I won't, I can't get this image out of my brain. This very elderly man who's just been in a car wreck and can't get out of his hospital bed, and all he could think about and all he could focus on was how many people he had already met that were nurses or other patients at the hospital that needed desperately to hear the gospel. That's all he cared about. He was like, I have been urgently sharing the gospel with everybody I can in this hospital. And it's like he, he, he didn't skip a beat on deciding, like, who cares what happened to me? Who cares why I'm here? I'm here to share the gospel. I'm here to love these people who are lost. And he had a burden for the people walking around him in the hospital that, that needed Jesus. We spent a week with a man who, uh, he and his wife are doctors, and they use being doctors as a way to fund their ministry. Uh, he's a pastor, bivocational. He's a doctor that's also an unpaid pastor on staff at his church because they can't pay any more pastors. So he has to fund being a pastor by being a doctor, right? He also became a doctor so that he could go to other countries and share the gospel, countries that wouldn't let him in if he said, I'm a missionary, but they will let him in because he says, I'm a visiting doctor. That's the whole reason. We met another man, um, his name is Jean. He owns an English school in three of the cities that we were in. Um, and he, he almost single-handedly used his connections in those cities to get us into all these public schools. We shared the gospel with over 3,000 kids in schools. And we did three more presentations just at his English schools. Just to, to, he just invited his students. And I'm telling you guys, it's, it's ridiculous. I spent the week telling Brazilians, there's nothing that makes Americans better than you. Because they have it in their head that the Americans are here. Drop what you're doing and let's just listen. Now, that's a great open door, right? It's All of a sudden, I can share the gospel because I'm American. But one of the Brazilians I met, he said that they have what's called a kicked dog mentality. They think, well, everything's better in Europe and America, so why try? See, I traveled all the way from America and I didn't have anything... I didn't have anything special to bring them that was more special than the gospel, right? It wasn't because I was American, now I'm here and I can save the day. It was because I was a believer and they gave me some added credibility because of where I came from. But that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't, if we hadn't been obedient to just go on mission. Emilio Ortiz has a story he tells about the first mission trip he ever went on, a man said, they went to the Dominican Republic, and a man said, uh, couldn't we just give all the money? Wouldn't it be better for us? Like, all the money we spent on plane tickets and, and hotel rooms, couldn't we just send the money to the church in this other country? And he said the missionary in, that, in the Dominican Republic didn't skip a beat. He said, absolutely not, because you will never think about missions the same. You will never give to missions the same you will be affected by this trip in a way that no one could have predicted and you couldn't pay for. I want you guys to hear me today. We're going to talk about Romans chapter 12, about being a living sacrifice. When I want you guys to hear me on this, there is no substitute for the Great Commission. There is no fulfillment in this life beyond that. I don't care if you accomplish all of your hopes and dreams. I don't care if you get married to the perfect person and you become a lawyer or a doctor or, and you have the greatest education. I don't care if you get TikTok famous. Like, <laughs> there is no fulfillment in this life apart from spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I saw believers in Brazil who understood that that was their fulfillment, that there was no substitute, there was no, the American dream couldn't give them that, that all they could do was share the gospel and that was what built them up. <clears throat> I want to ask you, have you ever stopped and looked at Christianity? 
Anybody in here ever read or just heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Got a couple hands. Um, if, you, if you're a believer and you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you will not be able to do so without crying. Christianity is full of people who have gone to their sacrificial deaths for other people. And that, that's different, by the way, than martyrs that we see in some religions that are violent. Or how about just cultists where it's not really martyrdom, it's just murder. Christianity is full of people who die giving themselves up. You ever wondered why all hospitals are named after Christian saints? The Christian worldview has moved across the, the globe and planted hospitals. We uh, Christian movements, Christian men and Christian movements are almost solely responsible for the abolition of slavery. Go look at it. Every, every abolitionist movement was started by believers. There has been things done in the name of Jesus that are, that are evil. But if you want to look at the lives of the people doing the act, you can tell who's consistently following the Lord and what their actions result in and who's just pasting the name of Jesus across their actions. The reality is that Christianity is unique. It's different. It has changed the world in ways that that nothing else does. And I am convinced that, that the problem with Christianity in America, the apathy that we have about our faith in this country, it comes because we forgot that this entire faith is about sacrifice, and we've instead replaced that with this American dream. We want what we want, and we don't want to give any of it up. We'll sacrifice now so that we can have later, but we won't sacrifice anything just for the cause of Jesus Christ. We've been in a series on Romans, and um, specifically, if you've wondered why I did just 1 through 8 and 12, the point was not Romans. The point was, we're going to do the gospel in Romans. We're going to talk about how Paul outlines and explains the gospel. But here's the thing. It's incomplete if I don't at least do 12. See, 1 through 8 is the explanation of the gospel, but if I stop there, it can leave you with kind of like a, and what do I do with that information? Like, so what? Right? I got, okay, great. I've been saved. Now, how do I live that out? So today, we're going to look at 12 because I want to give you the so what. I told you guys we're going to, in this class, in the college class, we're always going to endeavor to answer two questions. What do I believe and how do I live that out? Those are the two questions. Well, we spent Romans 1 through 8 answering the question, what do I believe? The gospel. Well, now we're going to talk about how to live that out. Paul starts in chapter 1 unmistakably by saying Jesus is the gospel. Not Jesus is a guy leading you to the gospel. Not that he's the guy pointing the way. He himself is the door. You have to go through him. And we we get this language uh, joined to him, united to him. The gospel is that God made a way for broken humans to be with him. But that way is Jesus Christ. We go through him to the Father. So as we get to chapter 12, Paul, Paul's going to say, because of God's mercy, because God made a way for him to get to himself, be like Christ. Act on it. Live it out. He's going to say, follow him. Show your love for the Savior by following him, obeying him. And chapter 12 begins a description of what that looks like. So I, I finally figured out the phrasing I'm comfortable with on how do we avoid right telling you in Christianity, go and do a thing without saying uh, Christianity is about rules, regulations, and all the things you do, right? Because that's always where it ends up. It's the battle between legalism and this like cheap grace that's just like, I can sin no matter what because you know, who cares, right? And, and so how do we find that middle ground? And I, I think the reaction is really in this idea of reacting. Here, here's the deal. If you go and do all the things you do in Christianity to get your salvation, you've missed it. That's legalism. 
I am overwhelmed by the love of Jesus Christ in my life, by the fact that he saved me, and I have no choice but to react to that love, right? And the Bible says as much. When it says, like, we love him because he first loved us, we couldn't come to the Father. We couldn't love the Father. We couldn't even know about God if God does not reveal himself in Scripture, in time and space, right? Like, we are reacting perpetually to what God has done. And if we react to the gospel, it changes from a, a list of rules and regulations to, to Christ's likeness. Look with me at Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay. He says, therefore, so he's connecting it to the gospel, right? He's connecting it to the explanation in chapters 1 through 10. And he says, because of the gospel, react. He says, I urge. I want you to see this. This is interesting. Martin Luther uh, pointed out that that phrase, I urge, is not a command. Now, Martin Luther said that true Christians volunteer for everything that comes in chapter 12. It doesn't have to be commanded because we're reacting to the mercies of God that he would save us, that we will act in these ways. Martin Luther said, No one will be changed by laws or commands who has not been melted by the love or grace of God. You can't just keep all the rules, but you can be overwhelmed by God's love. And he's, he's urging us to what? He says, Present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. Okay. Now we know... We have this phrase in Christianity, right? We, we say we're supposed to be Christ-like. That's what we're going for. And oftentimes, we really like baby that down to be like, you know, Jesus was like a really nice dude. Like, he didn't get mad at people. He was like very loving. And like, that's what being Christ-like is. And like, he, he didn't ever sin. Like, that's essential, right? He never sinned. So being Christ-like is that I don't sin, right? Okay, we're missing something here. What was the absolute pinnacle, the ultimate thing that Jesus did in his entire life. He was a sacrifice. He gave himself up. So how can you say, I want to be Christ-like and not imitate the single most important thing he ever did? And here's the thing about Jesus. He is the perfect sacrifice and he's still alive. He is actually the living sacrifice. Here's the thing. We talked early in Romans about being united in Christ's death means that we're united in Christ's life. Well, it's the same thing with the sacrifice. If, like, this is the thing. If Christ had come, died, and never came back, and was like, follow my example, you'd be like, why? Like, what does that gain me? I'm going to die, and then that's it. Congrats. Like, what did I win, right? But the whole point is that Christ says, Follow me in the sacrifice part and the living part, the still being alive part, right? The, the living sacrifice is, is important because prior to what Jesus did, what happened to all the sacrifices? They just died. They stayed dead. That was it. And so the, the, the picture was something, we need something that's going to pay this off because every time I sin, I owe death, permanent death. And it's replaced by an animal that gives its permanent death. But Jesus didn't do that. He was a living sacrifice. And if we're united to Christ, then our sacrifice ends in life. Life eternal. You can't be Christ-like if you're not willing to be sacrificial. He says, by the mercies of God. This has two meanings. I want you to see, he's saying, because of God's mercy, because God saved you, react. And he's saying, you're only able to because of God's mercy. God's mercy, his saving of us, is the only reason we can do anything that's going to come in chapter 12. The only reason that we can be living sacrifices is because of the gospel, because it enables us and because it, it, it's the only avenue to do it. It's the only avenue to life. 
He says, do not be conformed. Okay, I want you to see the difference between conformed and transformed. Conformed is an external passive, right? So it's like this. What do you have to do to be like the world? Nothing. Nothing at all. If you stand still long enough, you'll be like the world. That's all it takes, right? It's external because the world is molding you by force to it, the shape it wants you to be in. It's making you be a certain kind of person, and you don't have to participate. It just happens, okay? Transformed, however, is internal. It happens internally, and it changes you from the inside out. And by the way, you have to participate in it. How? By the renewing of your mind. How is your mind renewed? You read the Bible. I know you guys haven't seen me in a few weeks, but hopefully we don't go a Sunday without me telling you to read your Bible. If you are not reading your Bible, nothing happens. You cannot grow. You cannot change. We are told to lay this on our hearts because it has a transformative effect from the inside out. This is what renews our minds and transforms our lives. It is the only way. The big question that we always have is, what is God's will for my life? What am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to go be a doctor? Am I supposed to, here's the big one, right? Am I supposed to marry this person? Or no, right? Like we're always wondering this. We're always wanting to find God's glory. And he says, first of all, he's giving us the key, which is you want to find God's will? Read your Bible. Let your mind be renewed. But then he has it in, at the end of uh, verse 2. He says what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. And I actually like, I think the ESV, it says what is good and pleasing and perfect. Um, what is God's good will for your life? That you wouldn't sin. Why? Not because God, like, immediately your mind went to something that's like, God just about rules. No, because sins hurt us. They tear us down. God doesn't want us to sin because it's painful, right? It tears us away from life and, and truth, right? So the good will of God is that you would be morally good. The acceptable or pleasing will of God is that you would be in relationship with Him, that you would be one with Him. And the perfect will of God is that God would be glorified. Now, here's the funny thing. They actually flow down from the perfect. If your focus is on glorifying God, you will be in relationship with Him. You can't glorify God without being in relationship with Him. And if you're in relationship with God, you will less and less sin. You will, I don't, I don't believe in this version. Um, there's, a, there's a sect of Christianity out there that believes that you can achieve some kind of perfection in this life. Like you grow enough that someday you just, you're not sinning on earth. I don't think that's true. But the point is, you will continue to chase Jesus more and more, and you will continue to chase the world less and less, right? But, but notice what we do. We always go the opposite route. What is God's good will? Is the only thing, oftentimes that's where we stop. Well, I'm not supposed to sin, so I just, I won't do bad things. But God, who do you want me to marry? Okay, listen, if you will go, if you will focus on God's glory, being in relationship with God, the, who you marry will work out. Where you, what you do for your degree will work out. What you do for work will work out when you are chasing God's glory. But it doesn't work in reverse. And the enemy, by the way, like God's, God's will has been revealed to us perfectly in his word. The only thing we don't know are some of the details of our specific life. So where do you think the enemy wants you to focus your entire life? He wants you to look at the things that aren't spelled out. I can't be in here and be like, Taylor, move to Cleveland. Oh, there it is. There's the verse, right? And so what, what do you think? Like, of course, that's what he wants me to focus on. He doesn't want me to focus on glorifying God. He wants me to focus on why hasn't God told me where I'm supposed to live right now? Paul says, give God your entire body. And then he's going to go on to show what that life looks like. So um, we've gone through the body analogy several times. We know that the, that the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. And part of the reason that this, this is the representation is because uh, we naturally know that our body doesn't First of all, it follows the head. Like my hand isn't always doing a bunch of stuff that my head doesn't want it to do, right? But then on top of that, 
like we know that like your body's not at war with itself, right? Like you don't wake up in the morning to your fish just punching you in the face, right? Because that's like, and that doesn't make sense. And that's why that is applied to the church. Because when we abuse our ourselves, our body, our our fellow believers, we are doing something that's unnatural. That doesn't make sense, right? <coughs> Excuse me. We're supposed to be connected to Jesus. And here's the thing. This is why I tell people, you're me. Okay, don't raise your hand. But do you ever meet somebody who's like, well, I do church at home. Okay. You cannot be connected to Jesus and disconnected to what he is connected to. It doesn't work, right? So if you're connected to Jesus, you have to be connected to the church. They're, it's the same thing. I know, that was a good line. <laughs> so, so okay, so look at verses 3. Look, or start in verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly, if prophecy, in proportion to one's faith, if service, in the act of serving, or uh, of the one who teaches, in the act of teaching, or or the one who exhorts in the work of exhortation, the one who gives with generosity, the one who is in leadership with diligence, the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, he's going to start by addressing the total opposite trait to being in Christ, pride. He says, don't think more highly of yourself. See, we know pride is the root of all sin, um, and it is the thing that God is eradicating in each one of us, is the thing that God is trying to tear away from us. Pride is inherently self-centered. It doesn't make you part of the body, right? It makes you a cancer to the body. Pride is the thing that that tears the body apart. Paul says we belong to each other. I want you to understand something. True diversity is only in Christianity, right? See, apart from Christ, all the things that make us different and diverse just make us different. Christ is the only thing that unifies people who are so different with each other. Hallelujah. I, I, I want to tell you guys something that, that amazed me. I went to Brazil and I had love, love with believers who I would have never met. People I couldn't even speak the same language with, totally different cultures and backgrounds, but I had an instant connection and love with them because we served Jesus. That's, that's unexplainable. That transcends everything we know about life. What if tomorrow your hand got just too big for its britches and decided it was going to be an ear? Not only would you be down a hand, but you'd be up a useless ear. That's a big ear. Right? Yeah, right? Okay, it, right, again, the body analogy is one of my favorite ones in the Bible because literally every perversion of the body analogy doesn't make sense. Your hand can't be an ear. It's also not going to decide tomorrow to be in here. This is what we do in the church. People don't serve where they've been placed. And and part of the don't think too highly of yourself is this. Where does God have you now? A lot of times we're thinking, well, I'm I could do more. I could be bigger. Okay, maybe you will someday. Where are you right now? Where has God put you right now? What gifts has He given you? And are you serving with those gifts? Because he hasn't called you to what he's got you doing in 15 years. He's called you to what he has you doing today. He's asking you to participate. (coughs) Excuse me. This is not a sermon on spiritual gifts. This passage isn't even focused on spiritual gifts. Paul, like, lightly mentions a few of them in passing. He's like, do you have a spiritual gift? You got it from God. Go use it for the body, right? That's the extent of the emphasis here. But Paul has a point. Stop sitting on your butt and contribute to the body. Be a part of it. Find your place to serve. Because God hasn't saved you to be in receive mode perpetually. I I, I have to tell you guys something. In heaven, you will work. That might be a shock for some of you, but like, there's going to be work in heaven. Do you know the difference? 
It won't be attached to the Genesis curse to be unfruitful. Your work will actually be productive and fulfilling, but you will work. So this life isn't about just accumulating pleasure and being lazy, and neither is the next one. You're not going to get to heaven and be in full receive mode, so why would you be in church and only be in receive mode? We're supposed to be a part of the body, and we're supposed to look like Christ. Um, in verses 9 through 21, there are 18 positive commands and three negative ones. We are not going to go through them all in detail. Um, you could preach a sermon on, I mean, you could preach 21 sermons on those 21 commands, okay? But I want you to see something. G.K. Chesterton, uh, if you've never read the book Orthodoxy, go read the book Orthodoxy. It is a fantastic book. And one of the things he talks about in that book is he was an atheist trying to disprove Christianity. He wanted to show that it was wrong. And one of the things he noticed was he said there wasn't a stick too big or too small to beat Christianity up with. He said people on one side would beat up Christianity for something that people on another side would beat up them up for the exact opposite. I want you to think about this with me. Is Christianity too liberal with how we treat women? If you ask a Muslim, probably. Is Christianity too conservative with how we treat women? If you ask an atheist, probably yes. How can the opposites be true? How can the total opposite sides disagree with Christianity on two completely different things? Because if you ask people what, like, what's, there's a consensus about how Muslims treat women. It's, it's too, it's too harsh. It's too oppressive, right? No one's on the other side of, of Muslims going, they, they are way too liberal with their women. Right? That's not how it works. So why are we the ones that are attacked from both sides? And G.K. Chesterton said in his book, it occurred to him that it's like a man in a room who some people said was too fat, some people said was too skinny, some people said was too tall, and some people said was too short. And he realized that everyone in the room who was too short thought the man was too tall. And everyone in the room who was too tall thought the man was too short. And everyone who was too fat that he was too skinny, and everyone who was too skinny that he was too fat. It's that all of humanity has looked at the perfection of Jesus Christ, and as far as they are off of him, that's what's wrong with him. Because they have to be the standard. That's not the way it works. We are commanded to look like Christ. Look at verse 9. Love must be free of hypocrisy, detest what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Okay. So, he says love without hypocrisy. Okay, let's just, it's, this is a super simple phrase. Love is inherently not self-centered. So when you love for your own gain, you are loving hypocritically, right? It, do, it doesn't make any sense. He says, detest evil. Why? Because evil hurts us, and it hurts other people. He says, cling to what is good. Okay, if you've, let, let's just talk about, let's just talk about the one that, that we all, that we've all touched in some way, shape, or form. And I don't mean that you personally have had a problem with this, but I mean everyone in the room either knows someone who has had this problem or, uh, or they have it themselves. And I don't care, guy or girl. It's pornography. Right now, I could talk about the same. I could talk about cocaine, and we could be talking about the same thing. But less of us in the room have been affected by that one. So let's talk about pornography for a second. You know what happens when you use pornography? Your brain glues to the image that gives you a sexual climax, that gives you a release. You actually cling to something that is giving you a certain feeling. Now, there's a natural reason for that. Why? Because when you have sex in marriage, it's designed to glue you and cling you to your spouse, right? It's actually a good thing, right? But the problem is we've perverted it. We've, we've made sex on demand and in a whole bunch of unnatural ways. Like, like men, there's no woman in the world that can transform into all the things you want as you type on your keyboard. It's impossible. Your wife can't compete with that, right? So what's happening? Your brain is not only gluing to something evil, it's gluing to something that that can't be naturally reproduced. It's an artificial thing. And actually, that is the same for drugs. The high that we get from, you know, heroin, heroin's one of the highest highs you can get in the world. It's completely artificial, though. Nothing, you can't, like, eat a piece of fruit and get the same high that you get from heroin, right? It doesn't work like that, right? But here's the thing. 
Heroin leaves you feeling horrible. So does porn. But when you eat fruit, you feel better. Right? You, you, see, you see what's happening here? All right. The Bible isn't just trying to ruin your buzz and kill your fun. It is telling you that God has created a natural way, and if you will cling to what is good, you can be filled up, you can be healthy. But when we cling and we glue to what is evil, it destroys us, All right? And this isn't a sermon on uh, confession, but if you want to talk about how to get free of pornography or heroin, I don't think we have that problem in this room, but I, whatever you, whatever your secret sin is, there is freedom from that. It's in confession, and it's in the light. Come talk to me. We can have that discussion in depth. Um, and then he says something. I think this is one of my most, one of my favorite parts of chapter 12. He says, be devoted to each other, outdoing in honor, and be fervent in spirit. Uh, another translation says, be fervent in zeal. Okay? Here's what he's saying. Are you passionate about Christianity? Are you? Do you, like, it's, do you just drag yourself to church every Sunday? And just like kind of plop open your Bible like two or three times a week and read a few verses and say like a nominal prayer. Because if so, you are missing it. I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you for your benefit. If you go through that process every week and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. No, that's not what it is. Ask yourself why there are people around you in church who are losing their minds over the gospel and how amazing it is. And for you, it's just kind of a trudge. Like you're not actually participating the way that you think you are, right? Don't in, uh, I heard it said once, like some people have gotten just enough Christianity to be inoculated to the real thing, like a, like a vaccine from real Christianity. You cannot be filled up by just attending and just labeling yourself a Christian and owning a Bible. That will not do it. He says, outdo in giving honor. That's the selfless piece, right? Putting others first. Do you come to church? Do you come to church at all with the intent of loving others? Like, do you actually come here and think, how can I build somebody else up today? How can I make somebody else? How can I pray for someone? How can I bless someone? How can I help my brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do you just kind of limp in here, sit, soak up whatever the, the message is, and then go home and go about your life. Because that's not Christianity. It's passionate. It's full of zeal. Look at verse 13. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Uh, I'm sorry, certain 12. Uh, rejoicing in the hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Persevering in tribulation. Rejoicing in hope. Um... Okay, rejoicing in hope means rejoicing in what's to come, what we know is to come, what we expect is to come, right? And then persevering in tribulation means things are going to suck. Okay, what part of that? Like, like just those two verses and tell me where the Ferrari is and like the, the health and wealth and everything's going to be great gospel, the American dream. It's not there. This book tells me flat out that this life is going to be hard. It also tells me in James that this life is going to be a mist. Here one second, gone the next. Why would I put any effort into making this as pleasurable as possible? And, and especially, I'm, I'm in Ecclesiastes right now. And if you haven't read Ecclesiastes, uh, go read a book that makes you think, what the, what is the point of doing anything like crazy good and pleasurable on this earth? It's all vanity. It doesn't lead to anything. The, the, he, he says at the end of Ecclesiastes, the full matter of it is this, fear the Lord. Why? Because someday we're going to be in eternity. And in eternity, everything's going to be great all the time. Even your work is going to be great all the time in eternity. So quit focusing on right here and right now. You want your dream job? I have great news. You will get it someday in heaven. It will be your dream job. It will never change. It will be the greatest thing you've ever done. It will be totally fulfilling. So why are you stressing right now about having your dream job? Amen. Like, go to work and try to share the gospel. That's why you're here. That's the point. He says, contribute and show hospitality. This is the picture of a living sacrifice, not the American dream. 
When was the last time you actually really put someone before yourself? We're supposed to look like Christ and we're supposed to trust God. See, living the Christian life hinges on this, that we believe in what God has said. The oldest tactic of the enemy in the Bible is, did God really say that? What's happening? What's happening in that moment when the serpent comes to Eve and says, did God really say? He's not only questioning her belief in what God has already told her, but he's questioning God's character, that God has already stated something. And I want you to see something. All of sin in your life is a result of believing that God isn't who he says he is. All of sin, like why do people steal? Because God is not a provider. Why do people have premarital sex? Because God isn't, they don't believe that God wants to be intimate with them and fulfill them in, in, in that way, right? Why, like all sin is a result of God said it and I don't believe it. That's all it is. Right? And the Bible tells us flat out that God does not lie. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own own estimation. Never repay evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all people, if possible, so far as it depends on you, Be at peace with all people. He says, bless those who persecute you. I want you to understand that is an absurd statement. That's actually absurd. It's the same level of absurdity as Jesus when he said, turn the other cheek. Why why are we told to do that? It doesn't make any sense. We're told to do that because it's so different. It's so countercultural. It's so counter just humanity that it's a testimony. When somebody curses you and you bless them, they cannot possibly look at that and think, he's just the same as me. They have to see something different. And that is the opening for the gospel. (coughs) He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I want you to see this. In the world, no one is actually happy for anyone else. Everyone is happy jealous of other people's rejoicing and as soon as you start weeping the world will abandon you they will disappear no one wants to be around you when you're going through a tough time and no one wants your good time to be better than their good time the bible tells us to be happy for our brothers and sisters in christ when they are happy and to be right there with them in the misery when they are miserable to weep with them when they weep that Again, doesn't make any sense. Because honestly, if life's all about good feelings and and getting everything I want, then as soon as you're bumming me out, I'm like, yeah, uh, call you next Tuesday. See ya. Like, that's it. Right? I don't want any part of that. But that's not Christianity. Never repay evil with evil. Never. It, I want you to understand the, the line in verse 17. 17 says, never repay evil with for evil with anyone, respect what is right in the sight of all people. Respect what is right in the sight of all people. Does that mean always do what anyone else thinks is right? No. It means don't hinder the gospel. Don't hinder the gospel. Uh, there are there are examples in the Bible. People take things literally where they'll say, well, the Bible says women shouldn't talk in church. It, says, it does actually say that, right? Like, But why? Because in the context of the situation where that was happening, that was a hindrance to the gospel culturally specific, right? And we could get into that separately. But the point is, they didn't do that because it was wrong for women to open their mouth in church. They did that in that one specific scenario because they were doing everything it took to not prevent people from hearing the gospel and receiving it. They cared less about their own individual comfort and well-being and more about whether or not people got saved. Do you ever put yourself aside so that someone else can grow in Christ's likeness or meet Christ at all? Because that's, that is sacrificial. No, but what, what do we do in this culture? Well, I don't have to, that's, that's my right as an American. That's my right as a human being. What? Is it about you or is it about people's spiritual eternity? And he says in verse 18, and this is a key verse, if 
possible, live at peace. Listen, if somebody won't forgive you, it's not on you anymore. You do whatever it takes to make things right with people. But when they have decided that they're not letting it go, they are not going to to love you. They're just going to love themselves in this situation. At some point, you don't bear that burden anymore. You don't have to walk around defeated because somebody else won't forgive. You can you can do what you can if possible as much as it's up to you, but you can't control other people's reactions. Look at verse 18. Sorry, 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why can Christians love people that hate them and not worry about defending themselves? Because God has said that he will defend his children. Now, it's not on your timeline. Trust me, there's plenty of times that I wish God would handle somebody right here, right now, the way that I want them to be handled. It doesn't work out that way. But God has... God has, yeah, right. God has determined that He will defend His children, that He will protect His children. So you don't have to panic. You can love people who hate you because if they hate you all the way till their death, God deals with them in a way that honestly should make you sad. I can't, as a believer, wish for my worst enemy to go to hell. I, I can't. I can't fathom what that means. And for me, the person who hates me the most in the world, I hope that they meet Christ. I hope that they're saved. And check this out. If I make it to heaven with that person, guess what? We'll be reconciled. We won't be mad at each other anymore. We will be good in a way that we could never be good on this earth or never be good ever if they don't meet Jesus. That's why we love people even when they hate us. And we trust that God will protect us. The question is, do you believe him? It says heap burning coals on their head. We miss this. When American culture, when we see the turn the other cheek piece, we just think like punching back, like just be a punching back. We're missing something here. You know, and I, I, I use this one all the time because it's just so vivid, right? Two-year-old comes up to me in the parking lot, starts swinging, right? I don't just like, here we go, wham! Like, <laughs> it's not it, right? Why, why not? Because I'm bigger and stronger. I don't have to take out all my fury on this two-year-old, right? And here's the reality. When somebody hits you in this world, whatever, what, metaphorically or physically, and you don't respond, you respond with love, you're bigger than them. And the heaping burning coals on their head is that they know it. There is shame involved with striking someone who doesn't strike you back. It makes you feel small. There's only two reactions, by the way. When you... When you assault somebody who doesn't respond, you either get viscerally angry with them, like you lose your mind because how dare they not be like lowered to my level, or you soften immediately. I've done this. I've, I've seen this happen, like play out in real time. I had a cashier one time at a store, just like I, they were just having a bad day. And I walked up and they, they just, said, I can't even remember. They just said something so rude. And I went, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm so sorry. And I watched them just like crumble. They were just like, oh, like, no, it's, it's fine. And like, they, like they didn't know what to do, right? Because, because I didn't go, hey man, I'm the customer. You know, I didn't freak out. I just loved them. I put them first in that moment and they, they, they had heaping coals or they had coals heaped on their head, right? They didn't know what to do about it, right? And so, and, and that is the way we're called to live in the world. But you have to trust God with that. You have to trust God to be able to do that. In verse 21, he sums up the entire chapter. Do not be conformed, right? He started with that. Do not be conformed. And he ends with, don't be overcome by evil. Don't let evil shape you, make you into something. He says, be transformed. Overcome evil with good. That is, that's the Bible. That is how we live out the gospel. I think sometimes we don't even examine our behaviors. We don't even examine our attitudes and how like 
worldly they are. I mean, that's what struck me on this Brazil trip was like, just how much we've twisted the American dream into our faith to the point where we don't even recognize it anymore. They're the same thing. Like, like, you, and to the point where you can, you can go to a, you can go to churches in this city that will tell you that they're the same thing. Are you, are you trying to react to the gospel and see that God is enough? Or are you frustrated with God because, yeah, he saved me, punched my ticket for heaven, but he hasn't done all that other stuff I want? Well, again, I, I could preach 21 sermons from chapter 12 alone. It's a huge chapter. My goal with 1 through 8 was to describe to you the gospel. But if I leave you there, it's, it's incomplete. The gospel came to you to be lived out, to be acted on, to be reacted to. There's two ways to react to a chapter like chapter 12. I mean, like, are you, there's, the Bible is chock full of chapters like Romans chapter 12. And when you get to those chapters, there's two ways to react. There's the wrong way, which is this like shame and guilt, like, man, I, I don't look anything like chapter 12. And you know what that shame and guilt leads to? Apathy. You know what you do when you realize how much you're not like chapter 12? You don't even try. Why try? Right? That's the wrong reaction. You know what the right reaction is? The right reaction is to look at chapter 12 and say, wow, God saved me from so much. I'm nothing like chapter 12. I need God's salvation. I need the gospel because I, I look nothing like this. And then when I react like that, I turn to God and I say, God, help me. Help me be more Christ-like. Help me grow and be more like you. I want to look like chapter 12. I don't. I don't so much. But what I wouldn't give. Please change me. That is the right reaction to, to chapters like this in the Bible. My question is, when you read your Bible, if you read your Bible on a daily basis, how are you responding to it? Are you turning to God and saying, God, change me. Make me more like you. Or are you just checking a block? I did, in fact, physically open my Bible, and my eyes did, in fact, physically scan verses. Quiet time. Check. That's not it. Present your whole body a living sacrifice with zeal and passion and react to the mercies of God that have come to you. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of the Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.